It's the Wild West, and it's our job to take a patch of dirt and turn it into the best settlement in the West. I'll be your guide as we learn the one to five player game Wild Tiled West from Direwolf, who helped sponsor this video. In Wild Tiled West, that patch of dirt are these settlement boards, and these tiles are what we're going to use to build our very own settlements. It's going to take planning and a little bit of luck as we put up buildings, wrangle cattle, mine for gold, and chase off bandits. But before we do any of that, we'll need to set up the game. To begin, place the four tile trays in the center of the table like this, so that the numbered spots along the edges of each tray are in these positions. Place the scoreboard above the tile trays with the two plus player side face up, unless you're playing the solo game. Then randomly place the four cattle contract tokens on these spaces along the bottom of the scoreboard and ensure that each one shows its larger reward face up. For your first game, place them left to right, alleys, gold, bullets, and points. Keep a common supply within reach of all players for the bandits, alleys, gold, bullets, cowpokes, and point tokens. And depending on player count, place the dice you'll be using near the tile trays. There's two types of dice in the game, green prairie dice and blue river dice. You'll use some combination of these based on the number of players. We'll be setting up for a four player game, so we'll use three green and two blue. Also, keep in mind that at various player counts, some tiles are removed from the tile trays during setup. So be sure to refer to those details on page three of the rulebook if playing with two, three, or five players. Place the round marker on the mine cart near the top left of the scoreboard, and the four ace cards can be placed face up in the supply. And next, each player takes their own personal components. Take one of the settlement boards and place it in front of you. Each board has a normal side with better bonus spaces and a wild side with unique rules. You can also find a difficulty rating for each board here in the top right corner. If this is your first game, the normal side is recommended. Otherwise, choose whichever side you'd like. Place a mining track alongside your settlement board and one of your player markers here on the bottom space of the track. Place your other player marker on the start space of the scoreboard, beginning the game with five points. And each player should take a helper card, which is your player aid for in-game and end-game scoring. Finally, shuffle the stack of partner cards and place it face down next to the scoreboard. Deal each player two cards from the deck, and everyone selects one to keep face down near their settlement board. Partner cards each offer unique endgame scoring opportunities, so be sure to consider your options as you make your choice. Leftover cards are shuffled back into the partner deck, and then three are dealt face up into the supply. Randomly determine the first player, Give them the first player marker, and you're ready to play. A game of Wild Tiled West is broken into four years. Each year, you'll earn income from your gold mines, spend a number of rounds drafting and placing tiles to build your settlement, and then tussle with other players to have the safest settlement. You'll be able to gain points by building your town, wrangling cattle, mining for gold, and chasing off bandits. At the end of the game, the player with the most points is the winner. At the start of each year, you'll earn gold from mining equal to the value next to the marker on your mining track. At the beginning of year one, for example, each player takes two gold from the supply and places it next to their settlement board. You'll be able to increase your future earnings by gaining pickaxes, which move your mining marker up the track, so be sure to take the appropriate amount in subsequent years. And note that during this step of the fourth year, players can take their mining income as usual or choose instead to take just one gold and immediately get two pickaxes, advancing two spaces up on your mining track. And after everyone collects their mining income for the year, you'll play a number of drafting rounds according to the scoreboard. Each one of these orange arrows on the scoreboard represents a drafting round, as does the blue X where you begin the game. There are three steps to each drafting round. Roll and place dice, take turns drafting tiles, and then moving the round marker to the next space. To begin each drafting round, the first player rolls all the dice and places them in the matching slots along the edges of the tile trays. And all the players at the table can help do this. 
The prairie dice are placed along the left and right sides, while the river dice are placed on the river. If two or more dice show the same number, place just one on that number and the rest on the next numbers. And in the case of multiple 20s, move them to the one spot, and so on. Additionally, if a die is ever on an entirely empty row or column, instead place it on the next sequential number as well. After all the dice are placed, starting with the first player and proceeding clockwise, each player takes a turn drafting one of the available tiles. The dice indicate which tile stacks you can choose from. Each die allows you to draft from the nearest stack in the row, in the case of prairie dice, or column for river dice. If that stack happens to be empty, you may select from the next stack in that row or column with at least one tile in it. And be sure to pay any cost shown on the tile tray for the tile you select, usually one or two gold, indicated by these symbols. If you use a river die and only a river die, you can choose to claim jump when choosing your tile. This will cost you some gold, but it can be a strategic way of drafting tiles from the inner spaces of the tile trays a little earlier in the game. When using a river die, you may pay one gold to claim jump along the river, skipping over the nearest tile stack to instead take a tile from the next stack in that column. Remember, this is only possible with river dice, and you must still pay any gold cost for the tile you jump to. And you can even claim jump over multiple stacks, paying one gold for each jump, although empty stacks don't count. Whichever tile you draft, you simply take it from the tray and always remove the corresponding die as well, eliminating it as an option for other players during that drafting round. Once you have your tile, it's time to place it on your settlement board, but there are some rules for placement and some things you'll want to know for scoring. Let's start with the rules. Your very first tile must cover the blue X symbol on your settlement board. Tiles cannot cover cows, fields, hills, or mines. They cannot overlap the edge of the settlement board or each other. They may be flipped and rotated into any orientation you like. All tiles except for the first, though, must be connected to your starting tile, either directly or through an unbroken series of connected tiles. And connected means sharing an edge, not just a corner. And it's worth noting that each cow and field printed on your settlement board is counted in this way, once connected by an edge with one of your tiles. For example, if you place a tile here, connecting to this section printed on your player board, then that section effectively becomes part of your network of placed tiles. So your next tile could legally be placed along any edge of that section if you choose. And on your turn, instead of drafting a tile from the tile trays, you can build one or two alleys. Take one or two alleys from the supply and place them on your settlement board using the normal placement rules. If you build two alleys in this way, they must be adjacent to each other. In addition to these rules for placement, there are some scoring objectives and opportunities that you'll want to keep in mind. There are a number of icons that can appear both on your settlement board and on some tiles. When covered on your settlement board or on a tile that you've just placed, immediately resolve them and take the corresponding bonus. For a bullet, gold, or an alley, Simply take that bonus from the supply, and in the case of an alley, immediately place it on your settlement board following normal placement rules. Some other icons are more directly connected to scoring, both during the game and at the end. Each time you cover a pickaxe, you've claimed the adjacent mine and get to advance the marker on your mining track. The higher you climb on the mining track, the more gold you will earn during the mining income at the beginning of each year. It can also lead to some end game points depending on how high you climb. And note that the fourth space of the mining track represents an opportunity to earn a second partner card, which we'll explain in a bit. There are a few other ways to earn pickaxes in the game, such as on building tiles, but the effect is always the same. Move up one space on your mining track. On your settlement board, you'll also find some horseshoes. These represent key paths to blaze, so covering them with tiles will be helpful for your score. At the end of the game, you'll actually lose one point for each uncovered horseshoe remaining. Some tiles have aces on them that come in four different suits. 
Collecting matching sets or sets of different colors can score you more points during the end game. There are also ways of getting some bonus aces placing buildings like the fancy saloon. Also on your settlement board, you'll see a number of areas more darkly shaded and marked with a sign like this. These represent towns, and to complete one, every square of it must be covered by tiles. Whenever you do complete a town, score the points shown on the town sign, plus the bonus points shown in the current year of the scoreboard. So, for example, if you completed Malarkey Park during the second year, you'd score 9 plus 4 for a total of 13 points. As you cover your settlement board, you're going to discover all sorts of tiles, including buildings with all kinds of effects. You can reference the rulebook for specific effects for every building, but the color of the signs will let you know how they work. A white sign indicates something you'll get the moment the tile is placed. A pink sign provides more conditions for potential endgame scoring. A yellow sign will give you an ongoing benefit throughout the game, and a red sign indicates something you'll get once the building is surrounded. And something is considered surrounded when there is no space adjacent to it where a tile could be placed, not including diagonals. For example, the general store here is surrounded by tiles, printed spaces, and the edge of the settlement board. And speaking of things being surrounded, what would a Wild West game be without wrangling cattle? Green spaces, with or without a cow, represent fields. Some are printed on your settlement board, while others are found on tiles. A group of fields connected directly to each other forms a single pasture. Whenever you place a tile that creates or expands a pasture, if that pasture has three or more cows, you may wrangle it. Take a cow poke from the supply and place it anywhere in the pasture. Depending on the number of cows in the pasture, you'll score a different amount of points, and potentially a bonus from a cattle contract. Look across the bottom of the scoreboard, and based on the number of cows you wrangled, take the corresponding points and the cattle contract bonus if there is one. For example, if you added this tile and decided to wrangle the five cows in that pasture, you would get six points and two gold in this case from the cattle contract. Once any cattle contract is fulfilled for the first time, flip the token over so only the smaller bonus for that particular contract is available for the rest of the game. And you may choose to wrangle a pasture for fewer cows than are actually in it. While it will get you fewer points, it may be a strategic move to grab a particular bonus. The last icons you're going to definitely want to be familiar with are the bandits and the sheriffs who will help you handle them. Bandits will show up more and more depending on the tiles you add to your settlement board. For example, that saloon might be an attractive choice to get that green ace, but it comes along with a bandit. Bandits are a scourge, and you're going to need to enlist some sheriffs, not to mention some bullets to help clear them out of your settlement. Sheriffs are straight shooters, so whenever you have any bullets, immediately check to see if any sheriffs on your settlement board can shoot any bandits in their same row or column. They can shoot any distance and across most spaces. However, they cannot shoot through cows, hills, mines, or buildings. For example, this sheriff can shoot this bandit, but this one's taken cover behind a building, and this one is not in the sheriff's row or column. They always immediately take their shots if they can, so be sure to check whenever you add a sheriff or a bandit to your settlement board or gain any number of bullets. Mark a fallen bandit with the bullet you used. It's now a tombstone and will score two points at the end of the game. And aside from scoring a few points here and there, keeping those bandits under control is very important when it comes to the tussle. After the drafting rounds, each year ends with a tussle when any remaining bandits might stir up some trouble. Each player announces the number of remaining bandits on their settlement board, excluding fallen bandits. And the tussle space for the current year will show how many points are lost by the player or players with the most remaining bandits, and how many points are awarded to those players with the fewest. Any players with the fewest must also place a hill bandit from the supply on a hill space on their settlement board. After all, there's more room for bandits now. If all players tie with the same number of bandits, everyone gains the points and a hill bandit. 
And remember, the number of bandits on a player's settlement board is open information that you can check at any time. For the tussle in year four, only points are awarded or lost, and no player takes a hill bandit since it's the end of the game. And being the end of the game, it's time for players to tally up their end game points. Use the helper cards to go through each category together. First, lose one point for each uncovered horseshoe on your settlement board. Next, score points from buildings with pink signs. For example, the stables here lets you score a bonus eight points if you manage to cover all horseshoes on your settlement board. Next, score two points for each tombstone. And then it's time to score your aces. You'll get six points for each set of three aces and 12 points for each set of four. And remember, these can be the same color or different colors. And then check your mining track to see if you climbed high enough to score some points. Score the number of points shown to the right of the marker on your track. And finally, reveal any partner cards you have and score them according to their unique conditions. For example, the gambler scores bonus ace points for their three and four card sets, and the businesswoman can help a player score additional points depending on how many building tiles they have that are four or more squares in size. The player with the most points claims victory, and in the case of a tie, the player with the highest total of unused gold and bullets wins, and if there's still a tie after that, the players share the victory. If you're interested in a more advanced game, be sure to check out the wild sides of the settlement boards. And to explore solo play and more, refer to the rulebook and check out the Dire Wolf Game Room app for your PC, smartphone, or tablet. And if you have any further questions about the game or how it's played, please let us know in the comments below. We'll get down there and answer whatever we can. Until next time, of course, make sure everyone has fun at the table, and we'll see you then.